There are 24 hours or 1,440 minutes or 86,400 seconds in every day. We're gonna use the next few minutes of our time learning all about how we use the concept of time in aviation. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 15 in the GNAV series all about the concept of time. We're gonna be taking a look at the practical applications and time measurement skills that we use in aviation. And at the end of the class, we're gonna be taking a look at how we actually travel back in time. There are two different days that happen at the same time on Earth, which is very weird when you first hear about it. You basically have a side reel day and an apparent solar day. A side reel day is defined as the time between two consecutive transits of the first point of Aries. First point of Aries is basically a zero point for measuring positions of celestial objects like stars and moons and stuff like that. What this means in practice that the side real day is the time it takes for the Earth to rotate 360 degrees. Or 24 hours, or with more precision, 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. The other day is called the apparent solar day. So as we rotate around the Earth towards the east, we're rotating towards the east, we're also rotating around the sun in the same direction. If we measure the length of day as when the sun is directly overhead a certain meridian, let's call this 180, and then we time it until the next time it's directly overhead, because of this sideways movement, the sun won't be in the same position. The sun's over here. So it's actually going to take slightly longer for the sun to pass directly overhead this meridian. So basically, after one 360 degree rotation, or a side real day, we still have to wait a little bit longer for the sun to be directly overhead. The amount that the apparent solar day is longer than will vary throughout the year because the, Earth is, the Earth's orbit sorry, is an elliptical pattern. So at the perihelion, the point where we are closest to the sun, the Earth is moving faster, so the apparent solar day would be longer. And at the aphelion, the point where we're furthest from the sun, we're moving through the air slower, we're moving through space slower, and the difference wouldn't be as large. If we then in the, add in the fact that the Earth's rotational axis is slightly tilted, it makes the whole picture, again, a little bit more complicated. The side real day is a more accurate measure of time than the apparent solar day due to the changing nature of the sun's position throughout the year. So to make a solar day more usable, we take an average of all the variations in the length throughout the year and then create the mean solar day, which we define as a constant 24 hours. If we then apply the same averaging technique to the physical position in terms of rotation or its right ascension of the sun in the sky throughout the year, we can create a fictional mean sun, an average sun position. This average sun, this mean sun, rotates or appears to rotate around the Earth in a westerly direction. So it doesn't actually rotate around the Earth, we're rotating around it, but from our perspective it appears to rotate around to a westerly direction. The difference between the apparent solar day, the solar day that we're actually experiencing, and the mean solar day will vary throughout the year. And that means that the position of the mean sun will also vary throughout the year. And it goes to more or less plus or minus 15 minutes. Um, and it's only in sync a few times throughout the year. So in the diagram here, we have the actual sun position in the center. And that's either going to lead the mean sun position or it's going to lag behind the mean sun position. And if they're perfectly aligned, we would be in the equinoxes. The physical location of the sun changes throughout the year in terms of its right ascension or its celestial longitude, I like to think of. And it also changes in terms of its declination, its celestial latitude. That means that we end up with a figure of eight pattern, which is known as an analemma. And from this, we can derive a useful graph. And on this graph, we have the zero position being the average sun, the mean sun throughout the year. The regions to the left of the line 
are called sun fast regions. And that means that the sun will reach its highest position in the sky before midday, before the um, mean sun. And to the right is where the apparent sun is slow and it reaches its highest point in the sky after midday. And the vertical axis represents the declination. And you can see the sun only ever gets directly overhead at the tropics. It only goes up to 24 degrees north and 24 degrees south. So one of the most useful things is figuring out how far you rotate in terms of degrees and time. So if you think about the Earth rotates around um, once in 24 hours. So 24 hours equals 360 degrees. And then we can break down the rotation into smaller segments. So that means that in 12 hours, it would rotate 180 degrees. And in six hours, it would be 90 degrees. Three hours, it would rotate 45 degrees. And in one hour, it rotates 15 degrees. And you can bring it all the way down. And you can say that in four minutes, it only rotates one degree. You can therefore work out the time difference um, between two local meridian times if you know the change in longitude between them. So this is an example of how we would calculate those local meridian times. That would be the actual time at that meridian we're standing on. So at position A, which is north 30, west 001, the local meridian time is 12. What is the local meridian time at B? South 45, east 119 degrees. So we draw the effing picture to get things orientated the right way. So we pass through the Greenwich meridian at some point, so I'll draw that on. And position A is at west 001, let's call it over here. And position B, south 45, we'll do a very rough diagram. Uh, south 45 and east 119, so it's all the way over here. Okay, so we're crossing over the uh, Greenwich meridian, so we need to add the longitudes together. One degree west plus 119 degrees east equals 120 degrees of change in longitude. And we can work out the time difference there. So it'd be every hour is 15 minutes. Sorry, every hour is a 15 degree change. So we divide this by 15, find out the hours, eight hours. So we have an eight hour time difference between A and B, but which way are we going to add on the difference? So the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So that means that people living further east see the sunrise earlier than us, and in the west, the sun rises later. So B is further to the east. It will already have experienced midday and sunrise, so it's going to be ahead of 12. So at B, the local meridian time is going to be ahead of this by eight hours. That's 8 p.m. So every meridian of longitude will have a slightly different time on it throughout the day um, by four minutes, if you remember the time to arc sort of breakdown. This means that every location has a very different local meridian time. This wasn't a problem in the past when people could walk from places or ride horses everywhere, but once trains were invented and used in Britain and people could travel between different locations, problems came up with converting from one local city time to another local city time. If there were multiple stops as well, that would complicate the whole picture a bit more. And it was very confusing for people who used the trains and operated the trains because you weren't sure if you were arriving at 12 o'clock London time or if it was 12 o'clock Manchester time. So it was all a bit confusing and they came up with a solution which was time zones. So this moved the whole of the UK onto one time zone where the whole country aligned their time with the local meridian time at the Greenwich Observatory in London. And the time zone of GMT was invented, the Greenwich Meridian time. And it smoothed out this whole process. The time zones that we use, or the standard times of countries, are based on either plus or minus from this Greenwich Meridian. So some big countries like the USA and Russia will have multiple time zones, but other big ones like China 
make it a blanket rule of UTC plus eight. So UTC stands for universal time coordinated and it's equal to GMT basically, but it's not exactly. And some countries will also add on seasonal daylight saving times to this and temporarily change their time zone. So in the UK during the summer, for instance, our time zone is UTC plus one to add more daylight artificially. So UTC, the universal time coordinated, is the time standard that we define time zones from. So the GMT time zone is technically UTC plus zero. So there's a slight difference between the two. GMT is a time zone and UTC is the time standard that we base all those zones off of. So when trains came around, we moved off local times and into time zones. When planes came around, there was a kind of a similar sort of problem. It got confusing between if we were arriving at local time, if we were arriving at the time of the destination or the place we just left. So we essentially use a single global time zone when we're flying aircraft. And this is just UTC time. And it's time based off of the zero meridian. So it's also called Zulu time. This can be used as a handy midway point between local times and time zones, and also avoids confusion when you're doing long haul flying. For instance, if you forget to change your watch to the local time, you can say, let's meet at 0300 Zulu. And then everyone knows that you're talking about it's 0300 Zulu, even though it might be 7 a.m. local time or 12 p.m. local, you never know what the time is. But if you stick in Zulu, there's no confusion. So using Zulu time for this journey, this is maybe, I don't know, four hour flight, something like that. Let's call it four hours. We leave at 12 Zulu and we arrive at 1600 Zulu. Simple. So an example of how to use Zulu time to help with some questions would be the time of position A in India with a time zone of UTC plus five and a half hours is 12.45 on the 12th of February. What is the local time at point B into Argentina with a time zone UTC minus three at the exact same moment. So first point is to convert into UTC or Zulu time. So the standard time in India, we're using the time zone, not the local meridian time, is UTC plus five and a half hours. And that time is 12.45. And then we would take away five hours 30 find out the UTC time or the Zulu time. And the Zulu time in this case equals 7.15, still on the 12th of February. And then we would apply the time zone of Argentina onto this. So we have our standard time in Argentina equals the UTC minus three. Standard time in Argentina is 0715 minus three. It's going to be 4.15 a.m. still on the 12th of February. And the standard time would be different to the local meridian time because we've used a blanket rule for the whole of Argentina and all the specific meridian that we're on. The international date line is a datum roughly aligned with the 180 meridian, and it serves as the end of one date and the start of another. If we cross over it, we will either increase the day by one or decrease it. If we fly over it east, we decrease a day. And if we fly over it west, we increase by a day. I know this looks like I've drawn it the wrong way around because usually that's west and that's east. But if you think about the earth as rotating to the east, once we're up this end, east is actually this way and west is this way. And south we up to the top and north is actually down here. So a little bit confusing, but hopefully you can see that. So I say that the international date line is only loosely aligned with the 180 meridian as some countries decided to change over sides of the international date line to have better international relationships with their neighbors, which leads to some countries being on time zones which are 
UTC plus 13 or plus 14, when in reality you can only go plus 12 before you start going back down to the minuses. I'll link a video down below with a good explanation on this, as I think it's actually quite interesting, but it's probably a bit too in-depth for ATPL studies and not really that relevant. So if we throw in the international date line into an example and some questions, we see some quite confusing things. So a flight from Auckland, New Zealand, UTC plus 12, departs at 0800 standard time on January the 1st. It flies to Anchorage, Alaska, landing 12 and a half hours later. What is the standard time on arrival into Anchorage, UTC minus nine? So the flight time might not be realistic, it might be accurate, I don't know, I've never done this flight, but that's the example we're gonna use. So 0800 standard time equals UTC plus 12. That's the time zone we're in. So 0800 minus 12 is gonna be 12 hours previous, and it's gonna be 8 p.m. But the day before, so it's the 30, it's January the 1st, but it's actually going to be the 31st of December. That's when we depart in terms of Zulu time. We then fly for 12 and a half hours. So plus 12 hours, 30 minutes. We can see that we're landing back on January the 1st at 0830. That's going to be 101. And then we convert back into the local time for Anchorage, because that's what we're asking for. What is the standard time on arrival into Anchorage? So the standard time is equal to UTC minus 9, 0830. That's our UTC Zulu time, minus 9. So the standard time is going to be 2330. And we're back again on the 31st of December. So as an error check, we can say that we flow over the date line to the east. Therefore, we decrease the day by one date. So we've done that. And we've essentially flown back in time. We've flown back into last year. So a pretty handy trick. To summarize quickly then, so you've got two different days, a side reel day and an apparent solar day. Side reel day is one 360 degree rotation. The apparent solar day is sun directly overhead, the meridian that you're interested in to the next point the sun is directly overhead the meridian and it's going to be slightly longer than the side reel day because we're moving in the same direction as we rotate so that means that the sun is going to appear further off and we're going to have to rotate slightly more than 360 degrees to catch up with the sun but we can average everything out and say that the mean solar day is 24 hours the average position of the sun in terms of its rotation gives us the mean solar day, which throughout the year will either lead or lag the actual sun, and it can be roughly plus or minus 15 minutes each way. An analemma is formed by this moving left and right position, as well as the moving up and down position caused by the Earth's slight tilted axis, and it gives a pattern like this, and that'll be very specific to wherever you're observing it from. You have to take the same measurements from exactly the same location and you'll end up with a unique figure of eight for that position. A unique analemma for that position, should I say. So because we know that the Earth rotates 360 degrees in 24 hours, we can then make some assumptions saying that for every one hour, it will rotate 15 degrees, and then every four minutes, it will rotate one degree. And we use that to calculate local meridian times. So time zones were invented in the structure of UTC plus a number or minus a number and basically stopped confusion between very local times and formed standard times for countries to use. And if we take that concept a bit further out into the whole global space, we can stop confusion even further when flying aircraft by using Zulu time, which is UTC plus zero. So you reference everything to UTC plus zero. You'll see this on things like weather reports. It'll say, uh, 0800, this was the weather, even though we were in New Zealand and it's 8 p.m., you know, things like that. It's quite strange, but you do get used to it. And the last thing would be the international date line, which is roughly around with the 180 meridian. It's got a few kinks in it where people are living in UTC plus 13, plus 14. And if we cross over it to the east, we reduce by one day, and we cross over to the west, we increase by one day.